Stay. A long time ago, I was trying to convince this lady that music, in order to be really valuable, has to have a purpose. It has to have a value just beyond music itself. And of course, the point I was leading up to making is that music should have some spiritual value. It should lead us toward enlightenment in some way. And her reply was, well, what about music that's just for fun? And I was like, duh. This is clearly a lower level of understanding. Why? Because it strips away the value, the importance of spiritual music. It wasn't until much later, in fact, very recently, that I understood what was happening. She was speaking a certain language, the language of sociopathy. The language that a sociopath uses to talk to someone they consider a clueless loser. <laughs> this language is a negotiation of raw power. It's all about dominance. It's not trying to arrive at any truth because a person in that condition doesn't believe in the existence of truth, doesn't see that certain truths are more important or more valuable than others. And so what enabled me to understand this? I mean, I've been in so many organizations not really that many, but enough to learn the lessons that an organization is not about benefiting you. An organization is a theater, a play, a stage where certain dramatic acts take place. And the drama that's being enacted is the game of the sociopaths against the clueless and the losers. And there is particular actions and languages that are spoken in this play. There's certain standard moves in this game. But ultimately, what it's all about is power. The sociopath sacrifices all values, all morality, all ultimately all meaning on the altar of personal ambition and power. And they may win. Certainly we see today in modern society that the sociopaths generally rise to the top of any organization. But their victory is hollow because it comes at the price of emptiness. Now, this is very interesting because in spiritual life, we also find this kind of uh, negation of social values and morality. And ultimate the meaninglessness of all social conventions and linguistic constructions and so on. But, and this is a huge but, <laughs> 
in spiritual life, the ultimate meaning is consciousness, Brahman, the oneness of everything. And one who realizes this becomes immune from all suffering. This is self-realization, of course, enlightenment. So this book that I'm talking about, the most terrifying book in the world, goes into tremendous detail and technical analysis of these three types of people in organizations. The losers, the clueless, and the sociopaths. And the language that one group speaks to another or within one group to each other and how those languages differ and how their meanings are derived from the overall situation. It's a scary book because ultimately it comes to the conclusion that there is no social meaning. That everything in society <laughs> being attacked by mosquitoes here. Everything in society is just a construct, just a fabrication. But that we accept these fabrications as reality because we want to have a peaceful, simple life. And that's true. But where the book goes wrong, and it's a, a fatal fallacy, is that it does not recognize the absolute primacy of consciousness. Other than that, it's an excellent analysis. Venkatesh Rao is one of the smartest people around. Unfortunately, he's an atheist. <laughs> I mean, you don't even have to believe in God to understand that consciousness is absolute. That without consciousness, nothing else exists. You don't have to be a sociopath <laughs> to see that the values of society and so on are simply constructs. Any intelligent person can figure that out. It's not difficult. But it takes a certain kind of perverse intelligence to think that the ultimate truth is simply physics or chemistry and that our human values are without significance. Now that really is sociopathic because it removes in one stroke all of the self-calming, reassuring falsehoods that people believe in in order to think their life has meaning. You know, and, and the, the true part of it is those values are more or less arbitrary and they are created most of the time by sociopaths whose only aim is to uh, exercise power over others. But again, where it goes wrong is not recognizing the fundamental substrate or foundation of all reality is consciousness. I'm going to link to this book in the video description and you should read it. You should read it. And if you don't find it to be the most terrifying book in the world, <laughs> I'd be very surprised. Most people can't even get through it. And the reason they can't is because it busts all their balloons. It uh, destroys all their illusions. Uh, by reading it, you can become disillusioned. Isn't it odd that, that one of the meanings of disillusion 
or disillusionment is the same as depression. Feeling that life has no value or no meaning. Nihilism or nihilism. But the acceptance of consciousness as the fundamental reality counteracts that nihilism. Uh, it destroys the atheism by accepting that Brahman is the absolute, is the truth. Armed with that antidote, you can read this book without becoming depressed. Maybe you do become disillusioned, and that would be good. But because you have the antidote of realization of consciousness, it can't hurt you. It can't make you sad. You can just look around the way the world is and say, yeah, yeah, that's really the way it is, you know. <laughs> way back in the beginning of this channel, we did a series on existentialism, being in the world. And existentialism is very interesting because it very accurately portrays the problems of life in the material world. The only thing is it doesn't give any solution. Like one of the prominent existentialists, Jean-Paul Sartre, wrote a book called No Exit. In other words, this is the way it is and we're stuck here. There's no way out. It's hell. But that's really not true. The Buddha gave a wonderful teaching based on dhyana or meditation that shows how to counteract the material suffering. And of course, all the spiritual teachings in the Vedas are based on the ultimate premise that consciousness is it. Once you realize consciousness, there's no more suffering, you know? There's a nice saying that pain is inevitable. Suffering is a choice. It's optional. And that is because how do we measure whether something is pleasant or painful? We measure it in terms of our desires. If we experience something that leads us towards or seems to lead us towards our desires, we experience that or we evaluate that as pleasant. But if it seems to take us away from or in opposite direction of our desires, then we interpret it as painful. But keep in mind, whether it's painful or pleasant is simply due to our interpretation. So once we realize that I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi, I am not this body, I am not this mind, this ego, these senses, or the objects that they perceive in the world, then there's no more pleasure, no more pain. Everything is just part of a machine. And we are not that machine. We are something more fundamental, more durable, more anti-fragile. We are the consciousness from which all that other stuff is derived. And without that consciousness, it has no existence. And in any case, it certainly has no power over us, unless we grant it power. And this is the dilemma of the clueless and the losers. They grant power to the sociopaths because the sociopaths construct illusions that give them a false sense of security, a false sense of happiness, a false game that they can seem to play and win. 
So this is the game that's going on in this world, that's going on in human society. And this book, The Gervais Principle, is the deconstruction of that game. And that's why it's the most terrifying book in the world. And if you just add the, the teaching of consciousness to that, then it becomes actually a very nice foundation for enlightenment. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.